Welcome everybody to this edition of Monday Night Live. My name's Derek Harden and tonight I've got Justin O'Kart Stewart with me. We're privileged to have Justin with us because this is the 122nd Monday Night Live and Justin's appeared on seven of them. It's really important to listen to Justin and hear his views because he studies all news reports all around the world and appears on television, BBC, Sky News, uh, Radio 5 at about five o'clock in the morning. I'm never quite sure how he does that. Perhaps he will tell us. Uh, but I just love the way Justin puts it across in such a serious, entertaining way, providing us with so much wisdom. Justin, welcome. Thanks for joining us yet again. And uh, what's going on in the world at the moment? Derek, I'm very flattered. Thank you very much indeed. And a pleasure to be back and good, good to see some uh, old faces there again. But obviously not so old faces, but familiar faces. Right, if we go back to the person who's probably responsible for the National Depression, Mr Hugh Edwards on the Six Dot News on the BBC, um, where you have to listen to a depressed Welshman telling you actually that the economy is doing rather badly. Um, and if you keep on saying that often enough, people start believing it. Uh, and that's, uh, I'm not one of those people that keeps on talking about fake media and fake news and things like that. But you've got to be careful. If you keep on spinning things with us a rather negative view of things, then funny enough, people go around with fairly negative views. Let's be clear. We went through a huge series of coronaries, economic coronaries last year. Um, and but also bear in mind, we had that coronary in the face of actually an oncoming recession anyway, because uh, what's an indication of that? Look at some of those companies that went bust before the pandemic the likes of Carluccio's, Jamie Oliver's, Italia and things like that. Why? Because there are overgeared private equity firms and there were loads of them like that. And they were going to go bust anyway because the economy was starting to slow. Then we had the pandemic. We're all familiar with what's happened there. And we're still living with it at various levels of control. And none of us quite know what happens next because there could be another outbreak of another variation. Um, but actually, so far, it seems to have been managed. Uh, but yet again, still the BBC on this chart that actually, you know, putting up numbers of people who sadly died without putting into perspective as just how deadly this is compared to, say, cancer or something like that. We're going to have to live with it. But leave that to one side, but not forgotten. Since then, we've actually seen the global economy bounce back. And you can call it sort of V-shaped recovery, or probably that way around recovery. Um, and so it, it has bounced back. But... That's hardly surprising. We saw an amazing level of uh, government support. But I have to say, I thought it was quite imaginative the level of support if we were sorting different governments. Most of us wouldn't have actually been able to spell furlough, let alone actually work out what it was doing. And uh, in terms of the support debt uh, elements that were provided, and of course, we will now go through the process of finding out where the uh, bad money or good money went into bad hands. That's going to be almost inevitable. But it probably worked. I'll put it this way, if you hadn't done that, we would have had a very even worse position overall. And we've been able to afford it because we've got this wonderful mechanism of quantitative easing, which after the banking crisis, everyone assured us would never happen again because we couldn't afford it. Oh no, we've just done it again. Um, so uh, we need to be careful, but, but uh, that has worked. So we've got a global economy now, which is growing at um, around about 5% a year, which is around about the long-term average. The key issue though is what obviously happens next. It's not so much, you know, uh, having to deal with the current storm after the storm. It's preparing for the next one as well, both as investors and also as companies themselves. You might say both. Uh, let me also add uh, just uh, as citizens of the world. How much is this going to impact on us? Um, and is this and we are seeing quantitative easing is not a confidence trick, but it is a trick of confidence because it's showing you that we can put money into the system, it's available there to do, we can keep interest rates low, um, and that's fine and daddy. But you can only do that for a finite period of time. The trouble with a finite period of time is you don't know when the fine comes to an end. Um, and the, really that comes down to that one word that runs an economy, and forgive me if I bored you before with this word, which is confidence. People will continue to buy UK debt because the UK has never reneged on its debt. Virtually every other major nation has. Um, you know, the United States wouldn't go bust, but I think it was actually um, uh, Alabama actually did actually declare uh, bankruptcy about many decades ago. Um, but uh, people still buy sterling, they buy the debt um, on the basis that we're seen as trustworthy. But, you know, you can only keep on doing, raising this money through quantitative easing while people still trust you. At some stage, someone's going to turn around and say that the emperor appears to be somewhat sartorially challenged um, and they don't want to hold our debt anymore. Uh, 
but the UK, st the sterling uh, currency is still a reserve currency, but compared to the euro, the yen and the dollar, uh, and also the yuan, or the yuan is not properly a reserve currency yet, uh, it's very small indeed, and so it bobs up and down next to it. So, bigger picture, uh, global economy rec has recovered as a result of a huge amount of support coming in. Most recently, of course, we've seen the uh, Biden package finally go through from three trillion uh, trillion, I love that number. You can't get it on most calculators unless you used to trade yen. Um, uh, but uh, down from three trillion to one and a bit trillion, it's still a huge amount of money. And we can look upon this as Biden's version of the New Deal, Roosevelt's New Deal. And the real benefit came through of Roosevelt's New Deal was not because actually it actually went out and spent huge amounts of money and got the economy going. It created the confidence for companies to start investing again, as it were, going on their coattails to be able to build it up. You know, so whether it was the, uh, the freeways or further dam processes and things like that, that pulled the economy around. And if you want to be very cynical about it, it was probably the Second World War, which helped quite considerably. I'm not suggesting that's a way out of this one. and not terribly helpful. Mind you, considering what's happening in Eastern Europe at the moment, um, on the borders of Belarus and, uh, uh, and Ukraine, um, I think uh, there's a certain level of saber rattling going on over there we need to be uh, well aware of. So uh, I'm encouraged by this. And so the next stage is we're going to see uh, the, or not V shape, but sort of W shape as the economies continue to grow, but they're going to be finding their levels of weakness. Why? Because we come back to that issue of the supply chains. Bear in mind, industry generally, led by the Japanese, have made themselves highly efficient. You remember Sigma-6, which was the fashionable trend, you know, the ultimate efficiency of getting things together and having everything just in time, which is brilliant until it doesn't work. Because the only real piece of elastic is so stretched that when it does go, it goes bang. Uh, and there's, there's little, as I say, further flexibility in it because you've effectively got rid of that. That's what we're now having to do with. And so companies and economies have to learn to uh, find out what they have to do to build a greater resilience, greater flexibility. And that means companies quite often uh, cutting back uh, on investment overseas and maybe having investment more closer to home. Do I need to have supply chains going out to the Far East? Obviously, some things you have to. Can I actually bring some of that closer to home, smaller businesses? Uh, would benefit from that. Now, we're seeing a little bit of change of that, but there's a lot more ideas coming through, which I actually find quite encouraging. So a change in attitude as a result of this, where people are saying, I've got to de-risk my, my business if I can, as an investor also. Um, do I try greater localization of this to be able to handle? Um, and am I actually going to see the rest of the global economy also trying to move at the same time to try and grow? We've had interest rates at still emergency levels, Frankly, if interest rates go up from 0.1 to 0.2, it's not going to exactly make a huge amount of difference. But it, emotionally in the market, it does. Go back five years ago, we had that thing called the taper tantrum, which is not a tape here, which is upset, but the tapering of uh, the government support was enough to frighten the markets. Um, and we saw that uh, create a, quite a bit of nervousness. This time, rates have already started to rise and we haven't seen a tantrum yet. Uh, and that's encouraging. Rates have to go up. Uh, and so, therefore, we need to be uh, manage our way through that. Sorry, Derek. No, I was going to ask you about inflation, Justin. So what's going to happen about inflation? I'm seeing all these costs going up, all the prices going up. Containers, you reminded me, you know, containers stuck. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, the, I, mean, the, I was just about to come on to that inflation bit. Quite right. I promise you, this hasn't been done with rehearsals. Derek and I can't do that. Um, but... No, you're actually right. And this is the, the question coming through now in terms of inflation, because an entire generation have no idea what real inflation is like. Of course, that's not strictly true. We know what inflation is like, but high inflation. For those of us who go back to the 1970s with embarrassing pairs of uh, flared trousers and dodgy haircuts and tank tops, but you know, Derek did have some other clothes. Um, and they'll remember that we had uh, inflation at one stage at 25 percent, 25 percent. You could almost call it Brazilian. That's probably a bad description, actually. But Brazilian inflation, let me be a more detailed, uh, which at that stage, I think it was over 80 uh, percent. At that stage, uh, Derek and I were both in Barclays. I was involved in the Brazilian debt rescheduling um, and the wonderful rip off of American lawyers. But that's another story uh, to be dealt with. So inflation now, what do we look at? It's not just prices going up. The difference is embedded inflation. How much is embedded as opposed to just one year? After 12 months, it drops off again. And embedded inflation is where you've then got a process of continuing 
uh, rises in, uh, of, of pay, uh, and continuing rises in uh, basic commodities and such like, uh, or do you actually just find it drops off after a year, which is um, uh, obviously more beneficial. The difference between now in the centres, of course, when it comes to the UK, is we are a very unionised nation and are much more controlled. The unions now are tiny in comparison and don't have anywhere near that strength. Um, but nonetheless, if you look at input inflation going into manufacturers, uh, I've got figures, furniture manufacturer was running at 10%. Um, there was uh, another uh, company putting, actually building uh, uh, prefabricated houses. He was talking about 15% inflation. That does not translate through to 15% inflation to us, but that probably comes through as about 45 to 5%. And even the Bank of England, Mr. Bailey changed it, the governor changed his tone from saying, you know, it's, well, we're peaking at 4.5% to averaging over the short term of 4.5%, which would imply that his view is probably changing as well. It might be there for longer. And the Americans are certainly uh, very concerned about this being embedded. Um, and you mentioned containers. Just to give you an idea, my, my brother who runs a, uh, a shipping business out of Singapore, his containers he has to operate with, which were 18 months ago, £2,000 a container, now £18,000 a container. But even if you can get a container, because they're all in the wrong place. Um, and uh, so that's, again, one of those issues which are impacting on the, on the supply chains. So inflation, we have to watch out. It is there. Is it embedded or not? We don't know yet. But uh, certainly, I think it's going to be harder to get rid of this time than we've seen over the past few years. And will the Bank of England put up interest rates? As yes, we it, yes, it will. It was interesting. The big uh, debate last week was you know, Andrew Bailey, the governor, has had really very clearly signalled um, rates are going to go up. And that's what the market expected. Remember, we had sterling against the dollar at 138. Um, and uh, then, of course, the message came through. No, they're not going up, even if it was only going to be 0.1 to 0.2. Um, uh, uh, but uh, sterling reacted and dropped down to 133 against the dollar. That's quite a significant drop uh, as a result of that. But let's not be fooled. Interest rates have already gone up because you only have to look at, say, the mortgage rates, the retail clients. Six months ago, they were going up. They were tightening considerably. And this is an indication that banks, trading lines, support lines are not going to be generous this time. Um, and although the government has been will be trying to encourage them to do so, most of us are still frightened witless uh, of uh, repeating what happened in the, in the uh, you know, only 10 years ago. And what about Europe? Let's have a quick whiz round Europe, uh, because we don't seem to be very friendly with our friends uh, 20 miles across the channel at the moment. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, unfortunately now it's leaderless and rudderless. Who ran Europe? Uh, and of course, the answer was Mutti, Mutti Merkel. Um, and with Mutti gone, uh, who runs it? Well, Macron will say he does, uh, but the rest of Europe probably says he doesn't. Um, but, and this is one of the, I think, real rubs here of the EU. They have a problem, which is perfectly highlighted by, I think we mentioned before, the Visegrad group, which is a group of countries, which is uh, Poland, Slovakia, um, Czech Republic, and Hungary. Um, and they, their, their shtick is really, we were not run by Manchester, uh, Manchester, by Moscow for 50 years to have that replaced by either Manchester or Brussels. What they wanted, and they've been saying this consistently, also during the time when Cameron was going up and down, Cameron didn't seem to take any notice of it, saying, we want some of those powers given back to us. So that's what we were told. Instead, it's become more and more centralised. Uh, they had bought on a confederation of Europe, not a United States of Europe. Um, so it's leaderless at the moment at a time when Europe needs a leader. You know, there is a large bear's paw on the gas tap already had you know, uh, less than encouraging hints that unless you agree to Nord Stream 2, the new gas pipeline going into Germany, um, then we we'll may actually not actually continue with the level of supplies that we were providing before. So sign it and we guarantee it. Don't sign it uh, and we don't guarantee it, which is funny enough. Three years ago, they said they had guaranteed it. So be wary. Uh, and uh, here we have to be careful. There's an awful lot of hyperbole talked about Russia. Russia is a, a dangerous power. Putin is a dangerous individual. Uh, but, but Russia is not a superpower. This entire, now forgive me, I know to some of you I've already used this figure before, the entire value of the Russian economy is slightly over that of 50% of the United Kingdom. And Russia is huge, obviously, um, but its economy is tiny and doing very badly in comparison. It is dependent upon, despite what Putin said 20 years ago, 
We'll broaden out the economy away from commodities. And what's happened? It's narrowed the economy to be just about only on commodities. Its population has been shrinking, falling off a cliff, some probably pushed, I suspect. Um, and uh, to the extent you, if you want, uh, they're, they're offering free citizenships to Kazakhs and others at the moment, just to get the more of the population in there who they could actually then start earning tax from. The pop, you know, an economy where your population is shrinking um, and your, uh, your power base, your income base is weaker, uh, makes it very difficult indeed. So every time we fire a missile and go, ooh, uh, there goes another two million quid, well, it's actually far worse than the Russians. Um, uh, but uh, that's not quite how they see it at the moment. So put Russia in its place in all sorts of ways, but put it in its place. Economically, it is not important. It can have influence over things like gas and oil, but there are alternatives. What it will try and do is traditional in terms of we've seen almost uh, uh, forms of blackmail persuasion in terms of control, whether it's parts of Georgia um, or whether it's actually going to be Ukraine. Uh, and also at the moment, maybe further elements of the eastern states of Ukraine um, uh, or whether it's through its satellite Belarus uh, interfering with Poland by pushing uh, refugees across the border. All of those elements just lead to a level of nervousness we haven't seen for some time. And if politicians don't play their cards right here, it's very easy to make things a lot worse. So to go back to the question, who's running Europe? The answer is, well, sadly, you'll probably find it's the bureaucrats in Brussels. There's no political leadership overall. So there is another nation. You have the 27 members and Brussels. Um, and an awful lot of those members don't like the way that Brussels have behaved. The other issue, I don't know, we've, we've talked about this before. You know, is the euro going to survive? And the answer is no, it's not. It's going to fail, not immediately. But the reason it won't succeed is we currently have a single currency in Britain. Uh, but you have to have free mood of capital, uh, harmonized uh, banking systems and regulation, uh, and the same fiscal system. That does not mean the same taxes, but the same fiscal structure. Um, and that does not operate throughout Europe. And so the two things will constantly grate against one another. You try and put the Greek economy on one side next to the German economy and ask its cogs to link together, you'll get a hideous grinding noise. Um, which gives you the opportunity, Derek, to go back to your lovely joke about Mrs. Merkel going into Athens Airport on passport control, and they ask her occupation. She says, no, not this time. Um, but the Germans will never, uh, ever agree to the Greeks writing off their debt, uh, even though, realistically, it is, because it's never going to get paid back. Um, those economies are never going to be in, syn in, in synchronous, synchronous oh, whatever the word is. Um, and so it's going to need far greater reform. So the euro will eventually split on that. Um, it could split into the euro and zero, <laughs> North Europe, South Europe. Or if you had some sense, and uh, don't we go back far enough on this, uh, Belgium used to have a split currency, a domestic currency and an overseas one. So it can maintain its overseas debt, then have a lower level of interest rates for domestic economy and thus boost up that economy until they came together. Going, yeah. going back to Greece, I remember yeah. us talking about that five years ago. What actually happened to all that uh, Greek debt they borrowed off the Germans? Uh, we, still, they were going to give them a few islands, weren't they, for their holidaymakers and put a few towels <laughs> on the beach? Yeah, well, well, a few towels. No, could we have a few islands, please? That was actually at one stage being discussed, the transfer of islands. Don't be so stupid. Uh, um, but the point was, actually, the, the debt is still there. What's happened is, of course, it's been rescheduled and you rescheduled it. So it's effectively undated debt. And undated debt is basically debt you're never ever going to actually pay the capital on. The rates they're paying on it are tiny so they can afford to do so. But the Greek economy is still a hell of a mess because domestically, um, no, they are still not in a position where they can have uh, they can get the economy to grow. To get the Greek economy into a position where it can be as efficient as Germany, they don't want to pay tax. Well, no one wants to pay tax, but the Greeks actively don't pay tax. They've changed some of the one of the rules I particularly love was bar, they changed this year before last. Barbers had the ability to retire at 45. <laughs> now, I appreciate they are hairy people, but nonetheless, you end up with a particularly uh, difficult scissor hand because it's actually so thick, but even so. Um, so there are all sorts of areas where you, know, you could just see that they were never going to work with it. So in due course, uh, uh, the euro will fail and end up with a core euro and a sort of outer euro to it. Um, as I say, the quick way around that would be to actually split the currency domestic. So you had a tradable olive for Greece um, and you maintain the zero outside. South Africa did, did it with the rand 40 years ago. Yeah. And that worked, worked quite successfully. It, it eases the pressure domestically and allows the domestic economy to grow. So what about all this? Um, so we'll, so let's go to Russia 
back to Russia for a minute. They were yeah. flying bombers towards us on Friday, according to the uh, to the Telegraph. Well, they actually cut the gas off. I see we've ordered a few tankers from Qatar if we can get hold of them. Yes, uh, just uh, doing something on that. Uh, Boris is saying, uh, Qatar, uh, will you be our, uh, uh, our last resort for gas? Well, in case of actually uh, Boris's own holidays, probably his last resort for holidays. Um, but the Qatar is, uh, bear in mind, the Qatar is now owned quite significant swathes of, uh, of central London now. Um, after all, they bought uh, uh, what used to be Bowater House, a huge development there, and they bought the local grocery store just around the corner. There's a HA Rods um, and uh, to keep them. But so the, 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 the Qatar is, um, their economy, you go back 30 years ago, their economy barely existed at all. Then they found the huge gas field and now they've got the money. Um, and one of the key areas we'd always said was that we can have uh, liquid uh, 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 gas coming through um, and uh, have that dealt with at, at uh, Milford Haven, where they've got a huge supply for it. The trouble has been because the gas um, uh, demand around the world, you've had tankers carrying uh, the liquefied gas and actually just changing ownership whilst the, uh, whilst the, uh, the, the, the tank is on its way. And so you'd be more and more competition and a bit like us with our domestic petrol stations apparently running out. No, we just had a panic and so everyone queues like mad. The same thing happened with the gas price as well. Add that to them with a threat from Russia to uh, agree to Nord Stream or we won't guarantee the gas, uh, the gas delivery. Um, and uh, so, yes, you saw every reason why that price would go up. Mind you, there has been increased demand as well, um, but no, most of it is, in, is due to the squeeze. We've been talking about cyber currencies, haven't we, for, um, for months and years, you and I are saying it's just a punt. But uh, this week's FT said, um, you know, people are climbing into it. People are regulating it all apart from Britain and Britain's a bit behind the eight ball. What's your well, I, yeah, I, I disagree. The, I was actually writing, writing this week for uh, about on cryptos. Um, they're still very dangerous. Um, are they properly regulated? No, they're not. Everyone's saying we're going to get them regulated. Yes, all right, show me. Um, until you start doing that, we're still dealing with, with an unreliable asset. Um, well, all assets are unreliable, but I mean, just in basis, you had no base point for it. Um, you even had, do you remember, it was at, uh, last month, El Salvador announced that they were going to put Bitcoin as their official currency. Uh, that lasted a weekend. Mind you, if you look at El Salvador's own currency, the colon, um, that's probably not much more appealing either. Uh, I don't know whose colon it has to be, but no matter. But the point was this. Um, you have uh, a base which has no tangible value. You have a method of, of uh, production of bitcoins, which is hugely inefficient and certainly against uh, issues of green elements, the amount of power it takes to actually mine bitcoins. Um, and so you've got to be very careful. The bit that's interesting, which is why the central banks are looking at cryptocurrencies, is because it'll give them more control. Now, let me rephrase that. They're not so much interested in cryptocurrencies, they're interested in the blockchain system. And the blockchain system, I'm sure you, you all be bored witnessed by people to explain it to you, but forgive me, the simplest way of describing it is it's a spider's web. And anyone who touches any part of that spider's web, the rest of the web knows. Um, and so it can control it. Um, so actually, for someone like the Bank of England, it'd be rather useful to actually control the issuance of your debt, yes, but also then who owns your debt and what the transactions are and at what price. And they would be the spider in the center of that particular spider's web, making them making means that they've got good control. So the concept of the blockchain is really good in terms of security. But in terms of actual these uh, cryptocurrencies, still highly volatile and erratic. And the fact that uh, Elon Musk says sometimes he's going to support it, sometimes he's not, frankly, is just a reflection of the fact of how unreliable it is. Uh, so be wary. Yes, of course, it's tradable. Yes, of course, people have made money out of it. But in terms of actually having long term returns on your pension fund, you know, that's outright gambling as opposed to uh, investment, which sometimes can be called gambling, but has got a chance of a more reliable return by way of capital growth or yield, overall yield with the dividend coming off it. You ain't getting that off crypto. crypto. So is the outcome of COP26 going to make a difference to investing? Are people going to, only going to invest in green products? I, would, I mean, it's what well, we've had. Gosh, we've discussed this over the past 15 years, haven't we? We had sustainable funds. I remember at seven, we launched a sustainable fund, I think in 2003, 2004. 
and no one was the slightest bit interested in it at all. You know, it was all very good stuff, you know, measured sustainability. The trouble with ethics, people operating on an ethical basis, ethics to some people is an East Anglian county, to other people it's a method of, you know, a quality standard of investing. So you've got to be really very careful. Uh, ESG, the current flavour, well, it's not actually an acronym, but uh, the letters of uh, favour at the moment, of environmental, sustainable and governance. And so you've had people like uh, Legal and General, uh, uh, even BlackRock, although BlackRock, as they just operate trackers, may not have too much same impact on it, uh, actually saying they'll only invest uh, if it, uh, in companies which are ESG. And to speak to a lot of investors now, uh, four or five years ago, it was, I'll have a bit of green on the side to sound my conscience. Now, I want something which is actually built as a sustainable portfolio running through. Of course, that is only going to be tolerated so as you're actually providing the right sort of returns as well. Uh, so, yes, COP is uh, fascinating, not necessarily just because they've come away with all sorts of agreements in terms of um, and wonderful words to go and get the precise words of what they sign up to. It's the overall direction of change. And we know primarily, unless you're in the Nigel Lawson uh, camp of global warming, what global warming, um, but if you assume there is, then it's making progress towards that. But if you don't have China fully on board, India fully on board, and America fully on board, um, then uh, you know you can be there as the uh, as the foolish martyr doing the right thing, but getting very lost indeed. And I guess India, China, and America are about seventy percent of the world's GDP, aren't they? Yeah, well, actually, we've got one and two there, uh, and India is sixth, just behind Britain. And if it carries on like this, they'll overtake Britain in the next couple of years. Um, the French always say they're about to overtake Britain, but actually uh, um, uh, they're quite considerably lower. I think I mentioned to you, uh, forgive me, that if you take the GDP of a nation and divide it by its population, you get quite an interesting figure. In the US, per head in the population, it's about $54,000. Um, and if you go to China, instead of being $54,000, it's just on $3,000. So the economy, my GDP might be big, but it's got a huge population. So in terms of spending power, huge difference. Just a little comparison on that as well. Germany, which is a considerably larger nation than Britain, um, actually per head has a value of around about $36,000. And the UK, obviously smaller, but as a proportion though, actually works out at just under $36,000. So actually per head, round about the same. And the French actually come out about 28,000. Um, so it is fascinating when you just see that if you just want to look at one measure of an economy um, and uh, you can see what opportunity they've, they've got. So America can bounce back with consumer spending far stronger than, say, someone like China, um, because they're still a developing state and they've got a long way to go on that. But the Chinese economy and the way it's run, I have to say, should be a serious source of concern to all of us um, as the change that President Xi is bringing in is turning into a much more personality led Mr. and Mrs. Xi's you know, party time, uh, almost Mao too. Daft question, but why, are, why is China investing all around the world all the time in the UK, in Africa, etc.? I expect one, good divestment, but also huge levels of, of influence and control. Um, I mean, you know, Derek, I spent time out in, in Uganda, <laughs> despite what happened to the people there. And, uh, uh, and it's interesting, I was back up, um, what's it now, 18 months, no, two years ago. Um, and it was fascinating to see the amount of Chinese investment going directly in. And they make no, no bones about it. I always used to find it funny that the EU would pump money into Britain. And occasionally you see the odd sign saying, paid for by the EU. Every single motorway, <laughs> bridge or anything like that is plastered on it, courtesy of the People's Republic of China. Um, what you've seen here has been a fascinating change. Um, and forgive me if this sounds this is, uh, so, uh, just being slightly rude to the Chinese, um, but when they first started doing a lot of uh, external investment into uh, countries requiring uh, infrastructure, they did so because they would buy them influence and also they can sell goods on that basis uh, and it's political influence. The first people that were going into Uganda were brilliant. They did not, they weren't focusing on speaking uh, Swahili. They were actually speaking in the local dialects. They'd really trained up the people so they knew exactly what to hit and how to go about it. Ten years later, the second generation go through and they haven't got the dialects, but they speak Swahili and that's fine. The third generation, it's Chinatown, keep out. Um, and so in many ways, you've got this neo-colonialist uh, and talking to one chum of mine, quite influential individual in Uganda, who said looking for further investors into developing oil uh, areas, and it was anybody but China. 
anybody but the Chinese. And one of the issues that's come out, and this has spread around the world in all sorts of examples, a good example is Sri Lanka. For those who know the bottom right-hand corner of Sri Lanka, there's not much wandering around there, the old elephant, and that's it. Um, and the Sri Lankans were persuaded by the Chinese that what you need is a port. You need a large port here to service that whole area. To which Sri Lanka said, but there's nothing here. So uh, build a port, they will come. They don't say that, but it's a good line. Um, and uh, they did build a port. And they built a port, which just happened to fit just about all of the Chinese Navy in the Indian Ocean, uh, which, of course, makes the Indians slightly upset because the clues in the name. It's the Indian Ocean, not the Chinese Ocean. Mm. Um, so that level of angst there has been a source of difficulty. The main reason I tell, uh, tell this story is on the basis the deal was done on low rates uh, uh, of uh, interest. Uh, but any delay, like any good private equity firm, meant that it got ratcheted up very quickly. Within five years, that port in southeast uh, Sri Lanka is now owned by the port of Shanghai. Um, so they cross the line from good inward investment into starting to control. And like uh, all colonialists find out, is that there's a backwash against that very strongly indeed. So the Chinese are exporting uh, their influence as much as they possibly can. Um, as to deal with the West, if you're being a real cynic, uh, no, uh, Derek, we talked about this, you know, we go back to the 1840s, and the China regarded it as a century of humiliation because they had a weak government there um, and the Europe and every other nation, including Japan, took nibbles out of China. You know, our little areas, the Germans, the French, even the Austro-Hungarian Empire took some as well. And of course, we got Hong Kong. And we got Hong Kong because we thought it's a really good idea. Why don't we grow drugs like heroin, uh, opium? And why don't we sell it to the Chinese? And we always tell the Colombians, it's appalling. How come you're having all these exports of go going on? Not only did we force the Chinese to buy it, when they refused to buy it, we fought a, an opium war. Within in three years, we fought a second one to force the Chinese to take uh, the opium. And as a result of that, actually, that we, that's how we got Hong Kong. So as far as the Chinese are concerned, it's a, uh, a century of humiliation, along with the, what happened with the Japanese in the Second World War. Um, so it's almost, they won't quite say it's payback time. But certainly when dealing with the Americans, they sort of do regard it as a certain amount of payback time. But bear in mind, there's one thing that unless you've got Trump running it, you really wouldn't understand it at all. Um, the, uh, the Fed really does understand it. America and China can't do without each other. They are in a symbiotic relationship. Who's the largest owner of American debt? Well, actually, it's the American government, but that aside, um, the second largest holder of American debt Usually, well, it's either China or Japan. It varies, but the China's got an awful lot of it, and uh, the Americans need them to buy some more. Um, and so that's carrying on. And China needs America because who's the biggest beneficiary of Chinese exports? America. So this is where you have to get past the stupid um, uh, diplomacy of Trump, which wasn't you know, diplomacy at all. Um, it was shouting. It was one thing we all know in the Far East, which you don't do. You do not do it uh, in a way which embarrasses people. You reach an agreement. In a, in a private room with um, adults, uh, with consenting adults. This is an agreement, nothing else. Um, and uh, you, you save face. Trump actively went against that and hardly surprising, G didn't want anything to do with him after that. Um, but that was just Trump being well, his normal self, which is just stupid. Um, so that's the thing we should try and hang on to, to say it is not in their interest. So when we've got Taiwan as being one of the but number letters, Taiwan is a big issue. The Chinese do not regard it as a separate state. It's a re renegade state. And it will at some stage come back in. Five years ago, they were being, actually to go back, 10 years ago, the Chinese leaders were being far more creative because the politicians in Taiwan said, actually, maybe we could actually survive maybe as a sort of uh, two st uh, one state, but two systems, just like the one they had in Hong Kong. That went well. Um, and so we're unlikely to see that. Uh, but at some stage, as far as Chinese is concerned, they wish to flex their muscles. And above all, A, they want America and Japan anywhere near them. And B, will rattle sabers and see if actually the, the Taiwanese do want to join them back in in some way. Um, is America going to go to war over Taiwan? Well, question and answer. Um, and you only have to look at what happened with, say, Ukraine. Um, and the answer is probably not. There's another issue just north of Taiwan, actually, is those islands in the East China Sea which are literally a few rocks. Um, and the argument is about oil and gas rights. It's completely untrue. It's nothing to do with oil and gas rights at all. It's actually to do with face. Whose are those islands? Um, and who's backing down first? 
Um, and remember, the Chinese have one key issue with the Japanese. It's their inability to come out with one word. Sorry. Uh, the rape of Nanking, Nanjing, I'm afraid, is, is taught and well known. And every time the Japanese prime minister goes to the war shrine, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's tweaking the dragon's tail. Um, and so very little love lost there at all. Uh, so we need to be wary. China is flexing its muscles against India and the northeast borders of Assam. Uh, Kashmir, which is the Indian-Pakistan problem, isn't it? Yes, it is, apart from 25% that was taken by the Chinese. The direct interpretation of the document about that says we are taking over 25, doesn't say totally, we are uh, looking after this uh, area because of the political risk that's here, and we're looking after it on behalf of the Kashmiri people. Yeah, right. Well, I don't think they're going to be seeing that anytime soon. Um, so all I actually counted 17 board, major the border disputes that China's got around its borders. But China's got a big load of borders. That's hardly surprising. Uh, so I take the view that the Chinese are pragmatic and they need their economy to grow. The Chinese Communist Party are there because the economy is growing and your average Chinese wants to go on, make money, make some, do some business, go on with it. And if I have to put up with authority today and say it's running it, I don't really care too much. Let me do my business. If the economy starts stuttering, we saw it six years ago, and you ended up with only ones that were just about reported, if you know where to look, over 2,000 major riots, major riots. Um, and so they have to be pushed this very carefully indeed. And so what the Communist Party is a selfish party, it would, does not wish to let anybody else in there at all. Chinese punk companies only go bust when the party says so. And if you look at those property companies, they've all got primarily one thing in common. Their key properties are in Hong Kong. And the Chinese want to make sure that their mark on Hong Kong is we're running this and therefore the system is going to change. I know we had an agreement, but who cares? It's our territory. And so what's Britain going to do about it? Apart from said that aircraft carry without the aircraft. Talking about trust a little bit nearer home before we uh, before we close this, that's because we're nearly out of time, Justin. Sorry. Um, no, no, that's fantastic. Um, how, how are we getting on with trust over Northern Ireland and Lord Frost's uh, rather aggressive uh, negotiating stance over sausages. I, it is astonishing. I'm, so I find it actually personally, I say personally, my view is extremely embarrassing. We are known as a nation uh, of being extremely good at diplomacy and uh, being able to persuade people soft power uh, to help control the world. Backed up occasionally with a gunboat. Well, that was the days of Lord Palmerston. Um, well, actually, now we seem to be down to having shouting matches uh, with the EU uh, over something which is, you know, a, you know, incredibly difficult to manage. Northern Ireland to anybody outside Ireland doesn't make any sense at all. Even when you're in Northern Ireland, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. Um, and so there is the border, which the EU say, well, we've got to have some control on it, but we don't want an actual border. So where are where are the tax uh, controls going to be in the Irish Sea? But you think, well, how does this actually work? Boris agreed to one thing, and then some months later, well, renege on it or wish to reinterpret it, which depends which side you're on, and the reaction from the EU is perfidious Albion again. Can we trust Britain to do this? Um, and so the issue over things like those ships, uh, the, the, the fishing ships off Jersey and things like that, that's not the issue, but it's being used as an issue. Apart from anything else, do you remember the recent spat you had in Poland where the, where the Poles were saying Polish law is not subservient to EU law? Actually, it is. That's why when you sign up to it, that's the case. Um, but that's one of the issues. They said we want part of that power back here. Um, so the EU are very keen to make sure that Britain doesn't necessarily get what it wants, because otherwise you're going to have other people leaving too. So Brexit's seen a success. Um, and you've done nicely out of you and you've been able to get your way through it, then maybe I go elsewhere. That won't happen in Poland because how Poland's got far too much money, EU money going into it at the moment. They'd be starting bonkers to walk out the other side. Um, but it means the next generation running the EU are going to have a much more difficult structure. Gone is the great uh, European flag waving with Ode to Joy and this, that, that, all getting people, all of us would join in on that. I'm great to be able to solve European problems. But that's wonderful in terms of theory. When you get down to the practice of many nations interfering with one another and disagreeing over elements, well, frankly, we're almost back to sort of medieval uh, uh, policies in the, in the Habsburg, Habsburg Empire and the German statelets. So it's, 
you're going to need some strength to manage the EU to its next stage. And unless we can see some clear and effective leadership, I'm very concerned about that. And I think for investors, I think they need to be concerned as well. OK, one, well, we've got a question in the chat box for you. Uh, why is the FTSE performance not matched other markets? Isn't it at least 5% behind? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because actually, well, the FTSE stock, if you break it, sorry, the FTSE index, if you break it down, it's dominated by, um, and bear in mind, this is a weighted index. So the bigger the company you are, the greater effect you have it. So I could uh, you know, be in a position where uh, I could have BP and BP goes up, um, the market goes up, BP goes up, and I can have a perfectly good, much smaller company in the FTSE 100. And if my ship price went up by a little bit, it has no impact, barely an impact on the index. Something like BP has a significant impact. Now, the FTSE 100, which actually, of course, consists of, of how many socks? 101. Typical. Only in Britain would you manage that. That's because there are two shells. Um, but uh, what you find with, with that is that the FTSE 100 is dominated by banks, uh, by mining companies, uh, pharma companies, um, and uh, mining. Uh, and that means, actually, these are areas which don't really reflect the enthusiasm we've had for the tech market, where you've seen those uh, you know, glorious uh, businesses, uh, we all know the popular names of, uh, riding so well, you know, with the likes of Facebook and Apple and all those other ones. Um, and uh, we didn't have that. So the FTSE 100 is reflecting the fact that you've actually had more value stocks, uh, uh, but you'll see it picking up because the demand for commodities and the price of those commodities has been going up, so you've seen some improvement. But compared to the US, and it is always a classic, it always has been an issue uh, when investing internationally. The Americans invest because it's going that way, because that's what we're doing, even though occasionally it does that. The British tend to invest of, well, it's probably going to go wrong, but I might have to give it a go, but I'm not very, we do a financial, a financial version of EOL um, uh, as opposed to Tigger. Um, so on the basis that we think it's going to go wrong, it's quite a reasonable chance it will go wrong. I'm being flippant. Basically, the FTSE 100 has made up value stocks which not moved as far as, as, the, as the growth stocks, particularly on the tech side. If you reorganise the FTSE into different sectors, you get a very different picture altogether. Justin, um, we're out of time now. Will you stay on a bit for some extra yeah. questions? Delighted. Um, are, you still, are you still writing for the Daily Mail? That's what I want to know, because that uh, <laughs> really is my uh, negative paper never to read. Oh, dear. Yeah, well, a, a, a friend of mine, Ruth Sunderland, is, is the, uh, she's city editor of the Mail. Actually, Alex Brummer and Ruth Sunderland uh, are both claiming to be city editor, which means that one's trying to stab each other in the back. Um, and uh, so I suspect she will win in the end. Um, but uh, she just said, would I mind writing a weekly column? And it's, which is great fun. Um, but uh, I, I tried to wean her away. I don't want to write about stock tipping columns, which is the first thing, of course, she made me do. Uh, so we'll see how long that lasts. I'd far rather be in a position of actually hopefully giving, you know, I don't know, uh, useful information which people can tear up and ignore or otherwise, just on the basis of what I found and you found over the years, um, some of the old fashioned rules which tend to get forgotten. And it is fascinating. Some of the staff I've got at uh, regionally, the boys and girls there, uh, a couple of the boys have paid off their student debt with bloody Bitcoin. Um, and sort of going against to actually there, me sort of saying, it, you shouldn't be doing invest in that. And he said, well, we've actually just paid off our entire debt quite easily. Who's the stupid one? Oh, well. So, um, and uh, finally, regionally, how's that going? A region, oh, the, it's interesting. Getting it going is, depends on a different region sparking. And the whole concept, of those who don't know, is not to re-establish uh, stock, stock exchanges run by silly gits and red braces. There were, forgive me, I've known many of you know, in 1945, there were 45 stock exchanges in Britain. And funny enough, if you take the train down to Penzance at the moment, um, which does take you a long time, uh, meanwhile, next year you arrive, there's a sign on the left-hand side of the shed, it says Cornish Stock Exchange, and it really is a shed. Um, but there used to be a Cornish Stock Exchange based on actually the mining companies. I'm not suggesting we go back to that, but you could have regional investment hubs so people can invest in local businesses. There's no shortage of money. Um, and also a lot of these businesses find when they have to raise money, it goes to London. Everything gets centralized into London. The costs go up. AIM, which six of us started in Glasgow, was a light touch, low cost market, which the stock exchange are trying to kill off, raising the charges and things like that, but they haven't been able to do so. So what I want to go back to is actually seeing there's that gap between half a million and 15 million, um, which people find it difficult to, to fund, not private equity, not crowdfunding, 
Um, but investors taking a longer term view, which my view is five to seven years, not three years with private equity, um, give them an ability to trade that stock. You won't trade every day because they're small companies. You have to have matched orders and you have to be doing it maybe one or two days a year or something like that. Each company would be different. But I want to see a list for Birmingham, for the Midlands, a list for Manchester, uh, great for Lancashire, with the, Man with the Lancaster uh, index on there. You create an index, suddenly people start an idea of actually what, how's this uh, the market doing? If it's successful, it will attract more investors. If it's successful, it will attract more companies. And it pulls money away from, uh, from London, which otherwise would have been there. And quite a common theme I hear coming out of the Middle East is there are some great investments in Britain, but how do we get to them other than going via London the entire time through a relatively small number of people who will be very handsome with their charging structure? So regionally is doing that. So there are one or two areas now. We've got Southwest, we've got uh, the Northwest and Yorkshire, uh, and they will want to create their own, uh, as it were, hub. Regionally is behind it, but we're invisible. It's white labelled. Um, and uh, so Yorkshire would, uh, would have the, the Whinging Bastards Index or whatever they would like to describe you people from Yorkshire. Um, and uh, so the West Country. Uh, uh, so they would create that uh, interest in local companies. And more to the point, get access to them. There's a fascinating last week a company called Bank North just got its banking license. Um, and North does not mean it's operating in the North, but um, I'm quite sure why they call it Bank North. But the point is, they are operating for SMEs um, and going back to uh, some traditional banking structures. They're very well capitalized indeed to enable SMEs locally to get um, uh, access to debt. And then alongside that, we may put the equity side of it along with them as well. So we'll see how that develops. Uh, because a lot, of, a lot of companies with C bills and things like that have taken on a lot of debt and they may wish to convert that into equity, but we have to make sure that they're investable to start with. So I think it's a very exciting piece of financial plumbing. To everyone else outside that, it's exceedingly dull, which I apologise. But I want to get local coverage, local interest in local growing businesses, not just startups, to get people to invest and then have the ability to get out. There are lots of investment funds you can invest in, but can you get out again? Um, and uh, so I th obviously the politicians love it because why wouldn't they? Um, one of the only thing I'm af asking from the Treasury, many of you will be familiar with the EIS, the Enterprise Investment Scheme, and SEIS for even smaller companies, put the letter R in front of it. And so you've got a regional EIS. Now I can be investing in my local companies here. It doesn't cost the, com com uh, the government anything, but I've got a tax break to actually be investing in that particular region uh, be able to take that further. People would like that tax incentive. Governments will get more money in due course because the company is profitable, employing more people, they're gonna get more income. Um, and uh, so we're at the stage now where we know it works. We've done half a dozen companies uh, operating through, but we now get to the stage where we need to focus on those regions to have their satellite hubs working, marketing and developing themselves locally. Um, and then centrally we operate the system, but otherwise I, I, get in, I become invisible. Justin, thanks very much indeed for joining us. The seventh time you hold the record for Monday Night Live. Um, I hope you'll come back and join us in the new year when we can discuss uh, what's happening. But, but for now, Justin Urquhart Stewart, can I thank you so much for joining us? And can I ask uh, members to say thank you in the normal Monday Night Live way? Uh, Justin Urquhart Stewart, thanks so much. Uh, my name's Derek Arden. If you've enjoyed this live, uh, please like it on YouTube or the uh, podcast channel. And if you're on the podcast channel, please join us on a Monday Night Live. My name is Derek Arden. Good night. Good night.